Aaron Balsa. Welcome to Legally Contented. Please introduce yourself to our audience. Thanks, Wayne. I'm glad to be here. And hi, everyone. I'm Aaron Balsa, founder of House of Bold, where I help B2B SaaS companies build thought leadership content strategies. And I also help them hire in-house content teams and onboard them, train them, help them build out their processes so everyone can work together more efficiently. I also have a podcast called The Notorious Thought Leader. I was hosting it today, which is why I have this cute little t-shirt on. Um, and I also have a newsletter called Leading Thoughts. So my life is really all about B2B SaaS and thought leadership. Now, wait a second. This is a legal marketing uh -oh. podcast. What is a SaaS person, a thought leader in the SaaS world, a content marketer in the SaaS world doing on a legal marketing podcast? Well, dear listener, dear viewer, let me explain. I'm a big believer in research as being a key component of law firms, thought leadership efforts, yet so few law firms are willing to take me up on that offer. So few law firms are willing to plant their flag in the ground and develop thought leadership around research. And one of the things that Erin does very well is create research programs and work with her clients to create research programs that allow them to drive real revenue and establish themselves as thought leaders. So I thought, who better to talk about the intersection of thought leadership and research than Aaron. So yes, your background is in SaaS, but what you do for your clients is so relevant to law firms of all sizes. And I'm so glad that you're here. And thank you for taking the time to chat with me about research and thought leadership. But before we go into that substantive area, talk a little bit about your background, Aaron. How did you get into thought leadership, into content marketing? And as you've hinted at, you're quite a prolific content creator. You're putting out a podcast, you're on social media, you have your newsletter. When did you start to see content as a way for you to build up your thought leadership and your business? I won't take you way back because content and marketing is my second career. So I'll start you back about 12 years ago when I decided to start a blog on the side of my nine to five job, which had nothing to do with content or writing or marketing. And I started a blog and I loved it. It was an outlet for me. I've always loved writing. I do have an English degree. I was the editor of my high school paper and all of that. And I was at the hair salon one day reading my favorite magazine, and I noticed that they were looking for an assistant editor. So I sent my blog to the assistant, to the executive editor, and I actually landed my foot in the door as an editor first. We edited four monthly print magazines. And then from there, I freelanced for a while, mostly in journalism, digital and print, and I accidentally found my way into content marketing, which is a funny story. My husband took a job in Boston. So I decided that I was going to look for a job in Boston too. And I applied to a job that I was wildly underqualified for. I know women don't typically do this. This is more of a man thing to do. But I applied for a job managing a team of content marketing writers, even though I didn't really truly know what content marketing was because I had been a journalist and an editor, but I did have about eight or nine years of management experience from my first career. And I was an editor and a writer, so they decided to give me a shot. Because what happened previously was they used to promote writers that were high performing into management roles, and that never really went super great. So they decided to bring someone in that had the right management skill set and had an editing ability. And they figured that I could just learn everything about content marketing. Lo and behold, totally fell in love with content marketing. It's really my thing. Went in house, I worked my way up to a marketing director at a B2B SaaS startup and Inc. 500 company. And while I was there, really grew my freelance business, really grew my thought leadership and my LinkedIn presence, started getting invited on a ton of podcasts, started getting invited to speak at all these different conferences. And I decided to go out on my own. And here we are. That's such a smart way to do things, which is to say that you've got the normal nine to five or the career path that's giving you some normalcy, hopefully a steady paycheck, allowing you to pay the bills and provide for your family or provide for whomever you feel like providing for. But also on the margins, you're able to get your name out there and start to flex a muscle that you might flex more down the road. And we live in a wonderful world where it's so easy today and even for the past couple of years to do that through content, you can blog about some hobby you have. You can start vlogging. You can start a podcast about some 
thing that's not related perhaps to your core profession, but you love some aspect of parenthood or a hobby you have or some aspect of life, history, whatever. And magically through the wonderful world of content marketing and thought leadership, you now have a business mm -hmm. if you apply yourself, if you really want to have a business or you could continue your nine to five job and just do this as a hobby. But it's amazing what you can do with some direction and with content and positioning yourself as someone who does something and is known for something, the world, the opportunities in the world start to open up to you. Yeah. And I was very fortunate to have a really supportive company. I know not everyone has that. I was empowered to create during the day, knowing that as I'm growing my own brand, I'm also helping to grow brand awareness for the company I worked for. And I was just really well supported in my journey to also transition out of the company, which is something a lot of companies get wrong as well. Someone gives an indication that they might be wanting to leave and they just get shut out. I think that it's really important not only to treat your employees amazing while they're there, but also while they're on their way out and help them be successful in that transition because then you're creating strong brand evangelists. I'm like one of those annoying people that still talks about my job. I've been gone for a year and a half. I just loved it so much and they treated me so well. So I'll always be a brand evangelist. That's great. And on that point, or at least related to that point, I'm starting to see more articles written about lawyers who are becoming content creators while they're working at their large prestigious law firms. And their law firms are having the opposite approach, yeah. which is this, to say, you've got to paint or get off the ladder. You can't be a content creator, especially entertaining perhaps sponsorship deals or further monetizing your content because we consider that to be moonlighting. And your employment agreement says you cannot do any business, conduct any business outside of the practice of law for this law firm. So even though it's unrelated to the actual legal work, you have more and more law firms who are saying, hey, look, 30-year-old litigator or attorney, you cannot maintain your job here if you want to post on TikTok and go viral and start to build a following there, we won't do it. So it's the exact opposite <laughs> of the approach that your employer had. And I think law firms might have to soon really think deeply about cutting people off like that because they're going to find people who can do both, who can have that nine to five or for law, it's more like eight to eight or nine to nine yeah. job. And then produce content at night and on the weekends and still build a following because it's inter interesting content, yet still be able to do the work during the day. So interesting tussle there. Must be some element of risk aversion, right? So startups are all about taking risks and failure and learning from failure. Whereas I don't know a ton about law firms. Everyone that's listening, I am not a lawyer, far from it, but I would assume that there is a bit more risk aversion for obvious reasons. The joke in legal marketing and with often legal strategy is that every law firm wants to be the second law firm to do something, not the first. <laughs> yeah. They want to see if it works. And then they'll race to be the next law firm to get in while the going still good, not be the first one. And oh my goodness, perhaps fail and have to write off that expense. <laughs> Let's talk about research. Let's talk about thought leadership and research. That's why I asked you to come on to uh, the program. When we talk about research, especially in the legal world, I tend to think of two categories. One is where you are asking, you are trying to get the sentiment of people. So for perhaps a law firm is asking the general counsel, the head of the legal departments at maybe fintech companies, what they see as obstacles coming up over the next year or two. That's one category. And the second category is compiling information. So for example, a law firm that practices often before the Securities and Exchange Commission might create some research report on a quarterly or annual basis that looks at the number of a particular type of filing that is made with the SEC or the number of times the SEC opens an investigation or maybe the number of times the SEC opens a crypto investigation. So I view it as both kind of compiling information and creating information based on interviews when your clients come to you about research projects, how do you see research in that thought leadership context? It's interesting how many different perceptions there are around what the word research or report means based on someone's background. I know one time I was invited on a marketing conference to speak about research and original research. And I came with my talk track prepared, which is what I'm going to talk through today. And come to find out about half of the people that had signed up for that session were actually looking about market research. And that's the kind of research that you're doing when you are developing your product or service offerings, or you're deciding what you're going to do next with your business. So you're trying to research the market. You're trying to research what people want. 
with the sole goal of just growing your revenue and being flexible and moving your business in the right direction. So unfortunately, those people did not get that necessarily because when I am talking about research, the kind of research that is at the center of all of my clients' content strategies, it's a research where, yes, you're collecting all of these insights, but then there's another component. You're not just collecting them to fuel your business and your growth, which you are, you're packaging it in a really digestible format, beautiful graphics, and you're distributing it and using it as a vehicle to, number one, build trusted authority, thought leadership. Number two, generate leads, converting that traffic into leads, getting cold leads re-engaged. Reports work really well for that. You're giving it to the sales team. It's sales enablement fuel. You are getting mentioned in different industry publications. I've gotten my clients mentioned in New York Times, Forbes, Inc., all these big publications important in our world, as well as industry publications. So it's great for PR. The more PR you get, the more backlinks you get, links pointing to your website, which is then strengthening your demand authority and your ability to rank for critical keywords. So it has just so many benefits and that's just a short list. So it's not only just conducting this research, getting these insights and this market research, but it's also packaging it in a way that is valuable to your audience so that they trust you and buy from you. Can you talk about sales enablement and yeah. what that term means? Because in the legal world, you don't often hear about sales enablement. In the legal world, you have marketing and you have business development because people don't want to call it sales. Okay. So marketing is kind of one to many. We are putting out the client alerts, which are basically email blasts regarding developments in the law. And then we have the business development, the more one-on-one, -on -one, this is me pitching you one-on-one. -on -one. I'm trying to cross-sell to you what my colleagues can do for you in various other areas of the law that could help your company. But what's sales enablement? Because you don't hear that very often in the law. Oh, that's interesting. So sales enablement is essentially giving your in-house sales team what they need to effectively outreach. So the, your SDRs, your sales development representatives that are actually cold emailing people, you know, in your business, they might be cold calling people. You might have a field sales team that's going out on appointments. So you're giving them some content so that they are giving rather than asking. The problem with a lot of cold sales outreach these days is that it's a take. It's, hey, why don't you book time with me and listen to what I have to say? And it's, who are you? I don't necessarily know that I want to listen to what you have to say. So when you have this kind of research, you're not sending somebody a 50 page report. Maybe you're packaging the top two or three findings in an executive summary. It's a one sheet. It's really consumable. And you're giving something of value with no ask in return. On the other end, you have your account executives. Those are the people who in the, in my world, in SaaS, they're taking leads that have been qualified by different criteria. Yes, this would be a good fit for what we sell. And I will also say that SaaS isn't just about selling software. It's also about selling services. So there is a lot of overlap. The companies I work with are not just like a free product where you're paying $10 a month and you're using it. These are really complex tools that are enterprise ready. So entire organizations or entire teams are using these tools. So as you can imagine, the service component the workshops, the consulting, that's another big piece. So as I was saying, sales enablement is also to enable your account executives who are talking to qualified leads about the software and the services, showing them how it works, answering any questions. But guess what happens after that initial meeting? The meeting goes well, the prospect shows interest, and then you can't get them back on a second call for whatever reason. So it can be helpful to enable the sales team not only with the content, but also some talking points, some copy that they could put into an email so that they can reach out and reconnect with those leads so that those leads don't go cold and you can re-engage them in the sales cycle. So fascinating because at the risk of making this like a dueling banjos type thing where we've got, where we're comparing and, comparing and contrasting SaaS marketing with legal marketing, there really isn't a sales team at law firms more recently, that's changing, but historically, based on the ethics rules, lawyers can't solicit cold mm. would-be clients. So a lot of times you've got some firms responding to direct marketing leads. So 
Erin raises her hand and wants to attend our webinar. Now we can reach out to you after the webinar. But oftentimes the sales force is the attorney, the, the attorneys themselves going out there because the attorney will be hired by the head attorney at a large corporation. And that head attorney wants to get to know who their potential attorney might be. They're, le they're interfacing directly with them in person over Zoom. So it's a whole different world, but there is sales enablement in terms of the work that some in-house business development people do at large law firms in terms of preparing the materials, making the webinar scripts. It's a different form of sales enablement. It still helps the attorneys pitch their services mm -hmm. to clients, but it's not quite as regimented as you would see at tech companies, at SaaS companies, at health companies, just because of the differences in the industry. It's just fascinating to hear you talk about how div divvied up and segmented that work is. Whereas for us in the legal world, it's almost always the lawyers are the ones who are doing it all. So let's think of it in two buckets, the marketing, of course, that engine that is driving demand for your business. And instead of sales enablement, let's just say attorney enablement. Okay, there we go. That was easy. <laughs> when you're working with your clients, how are you strategizing the key audience for the research? Is that driven by purely the established marketing and sales business development goals? Or can it be incumbent upon the law firm or the entity to say, hey, look, this is an opportunity that we don't see anyone talking about this. We think this is, a, in, this is an interesting area to cover for thought leadership, even though it might not today be directly tied to our current goals, but it's somewhere that we might want to be in the years down the road. Maybe a bit of both, but I would say it always starts with your identified marketing personas, the people that you're marketing to every day. And there's all different ways that you can package up these findings. So many of my clients, many companies are looking to go up market, which essentially for anyone that doesn't know the term, they're looking to sell to bigger companies. And many times that involves very large buying teams of very smart, very skeptical, very senior executives. And these people are not Googling answers they're not Googling questions like, how do I do my job better? They are not doing the same behaviors that an IC or an entry-level manager might be doing. So you can't market to them in the same way. Many times how we are reaching them is through word of mouth, referrals from people in their Vistage group, referrals from people they trust, other executives, and at industry conferences. So when you're talking about doing a report and distributing the data insights, think bigger than just the actual 50 page or 20 page report. Think about how you can use those insights and distribute them through your human vehicles. So as an example, I'm working with one client right now and we're writing a report. We took a lot of the early insights and we gave it to our EVP who is speaking at a really big important industry conference and he worked those proprietary insights into his normal talk track, which would have otherwise just been opinion, of course, based on his expertise. So his expertise and his opinion, and maybe some external validation. But since we were able to really punch up that story or elevate his narrative and his point of view with proprietary data, it was very interesting to that audience. And he got amazing feedback. And now we can follow up by email with everyone who came to talk to him, everyone who came to the booth, scan their badge, we have their email address. Now we're gonna be able to nurture them, not by being like, hey, let's get on a sales call, but by saying, hey, you were interested in that, in our presentation and our data, here's the rest of the data, here's an executive summary. And you would find that really does open the door to better conversations. How often do you see your clients coming to the table with the subject matter they wanna cover in the research and how much of it is you or someone else on the marketing or sales side getting them to focus on a particular area that could be of interest to the target clients? They rarely know exactly what they want to talk about. So that's part of my job. So I hold brainstorming meetings, which I lead, and I have a formula for thinking through the right angle. So a lot of times what people think they should talk about or what audience they think that they should be surveying, or when I say surveying, asking questions in the form of a survey, it's not necessarily the best audience. And sometimes you only learn that through trial and error. And I'll give you an example of that. 
So we had a consultant audience, a partner network that sold and serviced our software. And there was a lot of them. And so we were always trying to grow that network by putting out good content for them. So not only are we selling to the people who are going to buy our software, we're marketing and selling to the people who are going to then market and sell and service our software. And they're consultants. And so we started off by doing reports that were serving other consultants like them. Our thought was that they would want to hear from others just like them who were successful. And it did fine, like a good report. Definitely drove leads, definitely drove revenue. But one year we were like, hey, I wonder if we said this is what CEOs want out of their consultants. So instead of serving high, instead of surveying consultants and saying this is what high performing consultants are doing, we surveyed CEOs and we said this is what they want out of their consultants. And wouldn't you know that thing was like hotcakes. We ran that, distributed that, collect leads for two years. It was really a really successful report. So sometimes you're really on, only going to learn who you need to be interviewing through trial and error. But aside from that, let's say you do know, we need to put out a report that really speaks to these senior executives. Okay, cool. So what do we talk about? Typically, people always want to talk about their product. Let's say that my product is a tool that helps sales reps sell virtually through Zoom or through Microsoft Teams. And I have this great software, so I definitely want to talk about virtual selling. Duh, that makes sense. But do you know how many other companies are putting out research and reports about virtual selling? What's your unique angle? And that's where I start thinking. I always talk about circles and finding the sweet spot. So picture like a Venn diagram and your first circle is your software or your service or your whatever it is that you deliver, your legal services. Your second kind of circle in your Venn diagram would be industry or market trends. Could be something as niche as an industry trend. So like in my world, in your world, in marketing, AI is like all anybody is talking about, AI writing tools, chat GPT. So that could definitely be like an industry trend. Or it could be like a macro trend. You could talk about the economy and the stresses that is causing to your audience. And then the next circle in the Venn diagram would be, are we being genuinely helpful? And I don't mean just, can we give these insights that are interesting, but how can we concretely deliver a report or this research that's going to improve our audience's life and be truly useful? And so it's finding that sweet spot and having these conversations and brainstorms until you get to that happy medium. You mentioned a point I want to come back to, which is sometimes you've got other competitors or other organizations out there who have covered an area with a research report that you're interested in covering. And I'm curious, when is that fatal and when do you ignore it and move forward? Because in the legal world, there are tiers of law firms and there are super prestigious, prominent law firms and there are pretty prominent ones and there are so-so prominent ones. And sometimes I can understand when a hugely prestigious law firm says, hey, we don't have any research in this area. We need to be the leader. It doesn't matter that this so-so law firm already has something similar. We can put our own spin on it. Plus the power of our brand will push this beyond the reach of that other firm's reach of their research reports. How do you deal with that when you're talking to clients? Yes, if you put your own spin on it. Of course you can. When I think about one of the most successful reports I ever worked on, it was about remote work. It was during the pandemic when everyone was forced to work remotely. Many of our clients were forced to work remotely for the first time, and they were really struggling. Our clients were executives and business leaders, and their employees were not doing really great with transitioning from working 30 years in the office. Now you're trying to work at home. It's pretty stressful. And from the leadership side, not only are you dealing with a great period of stress and change, you're trying to figure out how to motivate and engage your employees and you're not even with them anymore. A lot of companies during this period put out remote work reports. This is how many people are working remotely and this is if they like it or not. And it's, yeah, that's helpful, but how can you put your own spin on it? And there's always a way you can. What we chose to do was to not just survey a cold audience in our ICP, our ideal customer profile. We actually chose to survey 
our users because we had this really interesting data about their behavioral drives and their personalities. And we told this really unique story about how your behavioral drives, which are hardwired in you, affect your perceptions about working remotely. And it was a really interesting story, it did super well. And I like to use that as an example. You can't always survey your users or your customers, of course. Look to Forrester, look to Gartner. They're like masters in finding really unique ways to phrase things. A differentiator. They're coming up with really smart kind of terms and angles, and that, that's thought leadership right there. So they're not just reporting on the facts. 40% of people do this. That's boring. They're actually categorizing these respondents into categories and buckets, and they're coming up with these really interesting ways to spin the data. And that is what's really going to differentiate you. I love being able to identify a trend and then name it. Google it to make sure no one else has called yeah. it that. Maybe look at the trademark database, see if anyone's trademarked it. And then you could literally own it mm -hmm. by banging that drum over and over again through your PR, through your future content marketing, your future research reports. You can really hammer home and associate that, that trend or, or that name with the work that you do. But going back to the substance of that report you just mentioned and other reports that you work on for clients, what is the line between diving in and providing enough substantive information that this thing has meaning and it's not just a frivolous and superficial survey. How do you balance that? Because I remember distinctly after COVID just came out, or I think maybe it was like January, February, 2020, as COVID was starting to really come out throughout the US, there was a PR firm that did a really brutal, in hindsight, like a just cringe survey where they surveyed people about whether they would buy Corona beer oh. with the coronavirus coming out. And that got some publicity back then because that was an interesting, timely thing. But in retrospect, it's the stupidest thing in the world, right? Now that we have the benefit of hindsight. So how do you, when you're advising clients and what tips do you have for law firms and law firm marketers, how do you balance providing information in your reports that's truly substantive and not superficial, but also not creating a 300 page report where the executive summary is 27 pages and people just get lost in the details and the small print. Yeah, I would say first, the average reports that we're creating is 20 to 50 pages, really depends on how good of the data you get back. And it's okay to have a long report because you're not gonna deliver it all at once necessarily. Some people will download the whole report, but you're able to repurpose it and chop it up and sprinkle your data on your website and your landing pages. You're able to sprinkle that data into your, your sales decks when you're talking to prospects and trying to close deals. There's just so many ways to use the data. So just to, wanted to say that. But to answer your question, I really think that coming up with substantive, important, useful data and insights all comes down to the quality of your survey. And that is why if you're learning how to do a survey in-house or yourself, or if you have a marketing team, it's really critical to know how to write good survey questions. And I can give you an example of this. So from time to time, I get asked to take surveys from friends I know who are running surveys on behalf of their company or their clients. And if it's relevant to me and I fit the audience, I'll take it. And I always, without fail, end up emailing the person to give them suggestions on how to improve their survey the next time around. And this is what it looks like. So I'll be answering a question and it will say something like, think about the last purchase you made. Did you make the purchase? And then you can choose. Yes, I made the purchase. No, I did not make the purchase. Or, okay, so you made the purchase. Or no, you did not make the purchase. Okay, so here's the next question. Why did you not make the purchase? Choose all that apply. And then they'll list like four reasons. And I'm like, none of those apply, but they forget to leave an option for other explain, or they, there's no way for me to, to explain what I want to explain because none of their four options apply. They're thinking to surface level. They're like, oh, because it was too expensive or oh, because I already have one at home. Just thinking at the surface level is not number one, not gonna give you an interesting story. But number two, it's gonna give you bad data. Imagine if they had a box where they were allowing me to say other explain, and now I'm getting this really rich story 
and these really unique insights and a better picture of why people aren't buying. So that's just like a really basic example, but I see this all the time. I think people just rush to get the survey questions banged out because they're busy, but it really is an important thing to spend a lot of time on. I typically carve out a full eight hour day just to write survey questions. So there are some people listening or watching who are just whose minds are boggled that they would spend that much time with questions or have to spend that much time ironing out the language of a one a one single question. When do you say to your clients, what folks, now might be the time to bring on an outside vendor or someone not to help with the marketing necessarily, but to help with the actual conceiving of the survey and the outreach regarding the, related to the survey because you, client, you're just too darn busy to do this the right way. And we need this to be correct if we want to have any momentum and, and any benefits. Yeah. I bring on help whenever you lack the resources, whether that's skills, you lack the skills it takes, or you lack the time. I have a course. So I have a course called the Research Report Playbook, and it is designed to teach marketers or really anyone who has the time and interest to create a report. But at the same time, I would say you probably need to get help bare minimum with the questions and probably also with the writing because let's face it, it's a pretty heavy lift to write a report to wrap your head around these data insights. So I always suggest bringing on help if you're not able to do it yourself. If you have the team and you're able to do it yourself, that's fantastic. It's something that is a learned skill set and can be taught. So maybe you're not necessarily bringing someone on long term to create this for you year after year. Maybe you're bringing someone on short term to create this for you the first year. And then in year two, you're bringing on someone to really coach, oversee, make sure that your internal team is able to do this independently with success. That's a great way to do it. I can imagine the training wheels are on the first year. Yeah. And then the second year, once once you've gotten through that first pass, the questions can be tinkered with slightly to maybe update them based on world events and current events, but they don't have to be reinvented. And then you know how the process went last year and assuming that things are somewhat similar this year, maybe you bring on that vendor or that consultant just to do some light consulting, not to do the heavy lift. It's just, that's a nice way to to keep the effectiveness without having to bring on someone with the expense yeah. that you might have paid the first time. One thing with research that always fascinates me is the self-serving results sometimes. You know, it's like Coca-Cola releasing a survey that 99% of people believe the devil drinks Pepsi. <laughs> well, of course, right? Like, right, it's Coke, they're gonna have that. How do you avoid that type of bias in your reports when obviously people know at this point in, in time that there's always going to be some self-servingness, a little bit of self-serving, even the widely recognized thought leadership type reports out there, they always tilt toward suggesting that the creators, the creator of the report provides some good and might have a product or service that you might be interested in. How do you balance that line between not being overly salesy, but still positioning the research in a way that it helps the company, the organization with their thought leadership and their overall marketing and sales efforts? So I have a good friend who research reports are the core of her business. It's really all she does. And she has a very strong stance that research reports should never be at all promotional, at all tied to your product. If anything, that's the antithesis of thought leadership, which is what you're really trying to generate with these authority and trust building reports. I'm on the other hand, so I have had a lot of success with actually writing reports that she could consider a bit too promotional. And I'll give you an example. I'm not going to be like, hey, I'm Coca-Cola, Pepsi sucks. Like we're not talking about that level of promotional. So let's say that my, my software has these different capabilities that a lot of my competitors lack. For example, let's say I am an ed tech software. You can use this software to build courses and certifications to educate your customers. Okay, great. So what kind of courses should I build? Here's the kind of courses that 
tend to lead to better business outcomes. Okay, that has nothing to do with my platform. That's not promotional. Okay, so let's ask some more questions that map a little bit more closely to the platform. Okay, so what kind of learning initiatives drive the best business results? We're talking reduced customer churn, increased revenue, et cetera. Oh, okay, so we have these formalized education initiatives and these curriculum-based education initiatives. Wouldn't you know, our platform is one of the few that allow you to build these formalized and curriculum-based learning initiatives. You can segment audiences, you can set up learning paths, we're not going to say that in the report, but we are going to use the language formalized, curriculum-based, and we're not going to talk about the platform, but we're planting that seed in people's mind. And it's not that we're like lying or planting a seed that's not true. We're actually sharing with you what the data found. The data found that these types of initiatives result in better business outcomes. And guess what? After we are going to, you're going to download that report, you're going to read it, hey, we might email you or reach out to share a one sheet about our product. And guess what words you're going to see on there? You're going to see formalized, curriculum-based, and you're going to start, oh yeah, like I remember I read about that. And now it's all coming together. And that strategy has actually led to great success with certain clients. I think the trick is keeping it focused on being helpful. And that is helpful. You want to teach them what kind of initiatives they, they want to build. And then later down the road, you're going to let them know that you do have the capabilities, whether that's software or services, to help them achieve this goal. I think many recipients of the research are smart enough to understand that there is some connection between the subject matter of the research and the service or product provided by the company behind the research, but you don't have to make it so brutally intertwined that right. people roll their eyes, right? Like if you are a white collar and criminal defense attorney, and you want to put out a report regarding some aspect of federal white collar crime and something the Department of Justice does over the course of the year, types of cases, you don't have to end the report by saying, and oh, by the way, we represent clients no. before the Department of Justice. It's the fact that you do what you do and you are providing knowledge and guidance and research regarding something that impacts the people who you serve, that I think gets over that kind of promotional flavoring. If you do it in a way where to your point, it's helpful, it's valuable, and it's not a bludgeon over the head with buy our service, buy our service because of these survey results. Yeah, exactly. It's just coming from a helpful place. Let's talk about getting away from the substance of the research and actually the results of the research and publicizing it. How do you handle the write-up of the survey or the research report? Do you view that as a core kind of thing that has to get done in terms of this longer form research report? Or are you looking at how this will be used? And then you work backward to create your assets, including the master report. So I have a pretty regimented process. I have a template. It's part of my course. It's like a project management template. Started when I used to manage these end-to-end -end in house, but I still actually give this template to anyone who takes my course as well as all my clients so that they can use this because it's not as easy as just like writing some questions, writing a report. There's just a lot of moving pieces. So the template covers everything from planning. There's a lot of planning that goes in before you ever even write your survey questions. There's a bunch of different tasks that need to get done to ensure that you're writing the right survey questions. Then there's data collection. And you could be collecting data through a survey. You could be surveying a cold audience. There's a lot of market research groups that can get an audience for you. You could survey an audience, merge with a co-marketing partner. I don't know how it really works in legal, but a lot of times in my world, there is a like another company that has a similar audience, but we're not competitors. So we kind of band together and I'm going to ask them to deliver this survey to their email list and their social audience. And then at the end, we're gonna share any leads that we get, all the emails get shared. So that's like an easy way to, to collect the data. You could be using data that you already have. Maybe you did this big market research project and you're sitting on this mound of data and you wanna now find interesting stories within it. So there's just a lot of ways that you can collect the data. Then there's the data analysis. I don't do that. So I always work with a data scientist because 
it's not my thing. I don't do pivot tables. I don't necessarily know what to do with this gigantic CSV file of raw data that comes back. I outsource that. I work with a partner and then they make it look all pretty in a way that I can wrap my head around and then I write. So just thinking through all these different steps that happen before you ever actually put pen to paper and start to write is really important. So your question was like, how do I actually write? So going through, before I go into it, part of that planning phase is to try to identify like what would be a great, like ideal storyline high level. And I'm going to now look at my data and say, huh, here's some things I thought might happen. Did these things happen? I'm also going to go and look to find findings that have statistical significance. So if a finding is, oh, 2% more people do this thing, it's not that interesting. It's not that like significant. So I'm going to look for big gaps in the data. Or many times I like to interview or survey two audiences for one report. So I might look at leaders and their employees. And I'm going to look to see if there's any interesting nuggets or stories that show a, a disconnect. Okay, so I have these interesting data points. I have these interesting nuggets. But what do they mean? And now it's time to think and analyze and connect the dots between the data, our company's narrative and point of view, and then what else is out there. So this is like the real tricky part that a lot of people get wrong. And it's why I think a lot of reports fall flat. It's because they're just like, oh, the data says this, the data says this, and there's really no red thread tying it all together, tying it to those market or industry trends, tying it to what's already been said, other research that's out there. And that's where a lot of the thinking comes in. So typically if I'm writing a report, I black out a whole week and I might not take 40 hours, but I might, it really depends how much thinking has to go into it. That's a great point that the research isn't necessarily the end. The research is the means to an end and the end is the bigger story yeah. that the research tells your ideal clients, the world about the area that you are researching. Right. That to me is a huge deal because we're almost spoiled by the fact that when you read news reports about surveys, oftentimes the results are the, is the story. 85% of employees don't want to work in an office. They want to work from home or in a hybrid setting. That's it. Mm -hmm. But to be able to actually say what that means for the workplace of the future, if you're a furniture sales company or you're a consulting company, that really is the thought leadership, exactly. right? That, that is the ideas and the knowledge and wisdom that the organization has all coming to the foray and taking the research and saying, ha, here's the, sa the, here's the so what. And now we're going to give you the now what in terms of what to do now that you have this information and that we know this information reflects the way of the world today. Right. Exactly. And that's why some of these sites that have these thin blog posts and they have a stat and they just report on the facts and they don't analyze the facts. That's fine because they have a different purpose than maybe you or I do. They have a purpose to sell ad space. They just want to get people to click on like the click worthy headline. They don't necessarily need to win over a very sophisticated, highly skeptical audience. You mentioned your 40 hour, perhaps 40 hour process, mm -hmm. but generally speaking, if a client came to you on the first day uh, on January one and said, Aaron, for this coming year, we want to create this research report. We want your help in designing it on January one. When could they look into the future? When, how long does it take? <clears throat> to go through the entire process to the point where you have your assets ready to go out there with your marketing team, your sales team, et cetera, et cetera. If it's your first time, if you have a small team and or if you have a team that's extremely busy doing a million different things, I would say 90 days is a good yardstick. Um, this is why. The first month is all about the planning phase. You're planning your story. You're holding those kickoff meetings. You're identifying that sweet spot in your Venn diagram. You're writing the questions. Maybe you're finding your research partner. You're signing the contract. And maybe you're also launching the data collection. That's going to be a full month, if not going into the second month. The average study, unless you're just surveying a consumer audience and it doesn't, it's not a niche audience, you might be able to get your data back in two days. But if you're trying to survey like 500 or even 300 
CEOs or VPs and above, or let's say you're just trying to survey employees at large law firms, any kind of niche that's small, it could take you two whole weeks just to get that data back. So then another couple of days for analysis, some time for thinking, and now you need to write the report, which is at least a week. And then you need to have somebody internally or several people read it. Does it make sense? Is this interesting? Does this writer communicate thoughtfully on brand, et cetera? And then the writer's probably going to do a round of revisions. So now you have your copy. You still have to design it because you want to be able to have this report live on your website. Maybe you're not designing it as a PDF. Maybe it's just going to live on your website. But maybe you do want to have it de designed as a PDF because maybe you have data that shows your clients like to have a PDF. People will make fun of the PDF. I know we're in 2023, but we did a test. We wanted to get rid of PDFs and we were like, hey, when I say we, I, me and a former company that I worked with, hey, let's run a test. And wouldn't you know, there was a good portion of people who wanted that PDF. So we still had to take the time to not only build a whole web page, but also a PDF. So keep that in mind. You might have to be building this thing like twice the graphic design, working with your web developer, working with your RevOps team. For me, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that term, but in my world, it's the people who are actually setting up the tracking so you know how this is impacting your leads and your, your sales funnel. Are the people that are reading this going on to actually have a sales conversation? Are they actually going on to become customers? You wanna be able to have all this tracking set up before your report goes out into the world. And then, you know, if you have a sales team or your account attorney enablement, you want to put together a plan for how you're going to enable people to use this content. You probably want to do some sort of launch day. Maybe you want to work with your PR team. There's just a lot of moving pieces. So I like to think of it in terms of three buckets, which is a bucket per month. I will tell you that when I'm working with a new client, especially if they haven't done this before, especially if their internal team is super busy, they take a long time to review things. It can take four, or even five months. So it's not something that you're just going to jump in and ship in two weeks your first time. There are companies who have gotten really efficient at this, and they release very frequent, short, kind of bite-sized mini reports. That's another possibility. It really depends on your audience and what type of report they would expect. For people who don't have their SaaS marketing to legal marketing translation dictionary handy, <laughs> RevOps is revenue operations. And I want to just go back to the last point you made, Aaron. I love that. The idea of a quarterly report, probably you don't need to be more frequent than quarterly because not enough happens normally by month right. to month for most organizations. But the idea that you could have every quarter or every six months, your law firm, your organization is putting out a piece of information that audiences start to wait for and look for. How many marketers, Aaron, you and me probably included, are looking to the Edelman LinkedIn thought leadership survey that they put out every year? Because it's so chock full of information that also helps people like you and I make our point when we're talking to prospective <laughs> clients. But that becomes an annual event where people look forward to it. There's a whole bunch of marketing and PR around it. And that has a long tail that perhaps is going to be more effective than a report in 2023. And then one, two, three years later, you lose the momentum and right. you lose the kind of thought leadership halo that an annual or a more frequent report can provide. Yeah. I would say don't bite off more than you can chew. Start with one, see how it goes and then go from there. Can you give, you mentioned some of this in your last answer, but can you walk through, and, and I mean I mean this to be almost like a freestyle rap here, <laughs> all of the ways that you and your clients have sliced and diced your reports and created marketing assets around it from social media posts to webinars to podcasts. Like, What is the approximate universe of all the ways that you can use your research report for your thought leadership? There are so many ways you can slice and dice your report. I like to think if I'm doing one report a year, I'm going to have a repurposing plan that's going to stretch at least nine months, if not the whole year. So you're going to have your blog post. You're going to not just blog yourself, but you can actually go out and ask other industry experts to comment on the data. You could write a blog post with a quote from an expert or two. Typically what happens is if 
you know, you're lucky and you do a good job. They're going to want to share that because people's media companies or their social media teams share. So you're going to get that shared with a larger audience. And if you're lucky, they're going to link from their site to your site, strengthening your site SEO and your ability to rank for keywords. You're going to chop it up and use it on your speaking circuit. If you're going out and having conversations either on a stage or in a smaller group, not really sure what attorneys do. In my world, there's a lot of opportunities to have conversations in both small and large group settings. And you can use that research as the backbone of whatever it is that you're going to present to the group. You can host events. You can host roundtable events where you invite people to an in-person. You could have a dinner where you know you are talking about some of these findings. You can just repurpose it in so many creative ways that go far beyond what people think of as content marketing, blogs, and social posts, and webinars. That's just the beginning. That's a great place to end our conversation. Erin, thank you so much for your time. Where can people find you online and how can people learn more about the course that you mentioned? So my name is Erin Balsa, B-A-L-S-A, and I'm the only Erin Balsa on LinkedIn. You can also Google my name and my website will pop up and a bunch of different things will pop up. My course is called the Research Report Playbook. It's available on my website and it's also available on Gumroad. It's also available on a lot of really shady sites from people that pirate courses. I wouldn't recommend giving them your credit card information though. So yes, avoid the fraud. <laughs> and buy Erin's course directly through her website. Erin, thank you for your time. Thank you for your thought leadership, for your knowledge and wisdom regarding research. And I guess I will see you online. Thanks, Wayne, for having me. This has been fun.